Well, when you measure temperature, you talk about things that are cold or hot. For example, the, the air in this room has a certain temperature. What we measure is the speed at which particles that make up this air, molecule, air molecules, what, at what speed they move. So something that's hot on a molecular scale, those molecules are vibrating around. And what I don't mean is that a whole bunch of gas moves in one direction or the other. What I mean is the random movement of the little molecules. And they're moving in different ways, okay? So they might be moving just translation. They're moving backwards and forwards in three dimensions. Uh, or they might be spinning around really quickly. Okay, so that's also hot. That's another way of being hot. So if I had a little microscope that could allowed me to see each individual molecule in the air, then I could measure for each molecule how fast it moves. This movement would be in random directions, and also the speed would be different for different molecules, but there'd be an average speed, and that average speed would be the measure of temperature. So to give you a sense of scale, the average speed of a molecule in this room is approximately that of an airplane. And then if you have something like carbon dioxide, which is this shape, um, it might be vibrating backwards and forwards. So hot can mean different things. Hot is simply a measure of how much energy something has. And that energy takes a translational form, it takes a rotational form, and it takes a vibrational form. And it's actually, it's this vibrational form which is giving us all the problems with global warming. Uh, because all that, that infrared energy which is coming from the Earth happens to be at exactly the right wavelength to cause carbon dioxide to vibrate like this. And so the carbon dioxide warms up, so the temperature of the, the atmosphere increases, and gets locked into the atmosphere. Cold means absolutely the opposite. Uh, cold means that things are getting stiller and stiller. So first of all, you lose the vibration. First of all, things get locked into their basic shape. Then you lose the rotation. So things stop rotating and become static. And then finally, you lose the translation and things eventually get down to very, very still. Now, of course, and, and when they're stationary, that's absolute zero. But of course, we can't do that. We can't get to stationary. Uh, there's certain laws of quantum mechanics, which we're not going to go into, I understand, right? But there are certain laws of quantum mechanics, which means that it can't be stationary. In this laboratory, we go to extremes in this in the way of temperatures, and we make here uh, temperatures, we produce gases that have temperatures that are much lower than anything you'd find in nature. We can take temperatures right down to 100 microkelvin a million times colder than our cold day. That's quite remarkable. And at those temperatures, we really start to see quantum mechanics playing an effect, or playing a very significant role in what we're talking about when we're talking about temperature. We use laser light to shine this light onto a collection of atoms. We arrange our, our laser light in such a way that we actually um, directly work on that, on that speed of these particles and um, reduce the speed to almost zero. And at that temperature, the whole temperature scale stops really meaning something. And what you're really just talking about is how much energy the molecules have. So what you see here is these, these um, steel parts. And then uh, at some, some point, we also have glass. So we have windows in this. And what happens is it, it, it's airtight. So um, the air in this room won't get into this. And then on, on this side of the apparatus, we have a whole bunch of things covered in tin foil. And these things are pumps. So basically like vacuum cleaners, just better ones. And they, they evacuate this vacuum chamber here, this steel chamber. And Hang on, and, what, and what's this? <laughs> this is something that allows me, someone at my height, to actually approach this without slaying my head into what I just did here. Um, this is one of the few things in this lab that I built personally. And I'd like to say that uh, this vacuum is really good vacuum. It's really um, the, the, the density of, of molecules inside this chamber is a million times a million times less than this room. So the pressure is that much lower in there. So there's really almost nothing in there. And then what we do is we put in a few of these rubidium atoms that we like, and then from the outside, and that's why where the windows and the glass comes into play, we shine laser beams. For example, these mirrors that you see all over the place here, they allow us to shine laser light from all directions. So this is a cloud of half a billion rubidium atoms. And we shine laser light from all different directions onto this cloud. 
And this is arranged in a smart way. And that, that, uh, that actually um, means that, that these atoms are slowed down by, by this light. They, they, they absorb light from these beams and they re-emit light that has slightly more energy and that's wh how they become slow. And slow means cold. So it's about a few million times colder than the air in this room. But, but what Peter showed you, well, we're going to go much colder than that. So we're at that temperature now, but in the next six months, we expect to go a thousand times colder than that, down to 100 nano Kelvin, which is a billion times colder than our original cold day. And at that temperature, everything is quantum mechanical. And the whole world, as we intuitively understand it, no longer exists. We start to see really different, weird effects coming into play. And that's, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. That's what I find truly exciting about being a physicist.